Hi guys, and welcome to our week, two weeks on part of speech tagging. So let's jump in to our next task. Maybe, there we go. So as a recap, what we've established so far in our first couple weeks of lecture is that text is very messy and requires a good bit of work to clean up. If I can figure out how to work my keyboard. So there's no one set of steps that you have to take to clean up text, but you've learned a large list of possible things to do when working with text. So now let's go on to see how we can begin to process and label text. First, let's talk a little bit about syntax. So syntax is a set of rules that we use to put words together to build well-formed sentences. Now, when I say well-formed here, I don't mean like some English grammar teacher or Grammarly is telling you the best way to form this sentence. What I mean is that there's a, a, a set of rules that allow us to understand the meaning from that sentence, even if it's not perfectly formed according to some, some person, right? So generally, this involves a whole lot of word order. And so as long as it's close enough, <laughs> we can um, interpret those sentences. So syntax and grammar, we're gonna use these a bit interchangeably. Don't tell my linguistics professor, but uh, here when we say well-formed sentences, that there are rules for us to, for comprehension, not necessarily rules for style. Okay. And so the way that these are built up is we start with words, we put them into phrases or clauses, those go together to form sentences. Sentences go together to form paragraphs. And then at the very top, most people call this either discourse or documents, okay? A collection of documents or discourse is a corpus. Now, remember when we talk about constituents, this depends on the level of analysis. So a word is a constituent of a phrase and a sentence. Words a constituent of all of them really. Uh, phrases are constituents of sentences and so on. Most of the work we're going to do this week is at the level of words. So we're starting at the lowest level and throughout the semester, we'll work our way up to the highest level. All right, so one of the most important rules for syntax, let's put me down here right now, um, is word order. If we scramble the words in a sentence, meaning is often lost. And this is in languages nearly every language that um, where word order is very important even in signed languages like ASL order can be um, useful for knowing who's doing what to whom and so word order is one of those key syntax rules that allows us to comprehend what's happening it's not the only rule though we also have things like um, subject verb agreement but it's not the only thing that makes a sentence make sense so here is a very famous sentence from Chomsky, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. This is syntactically correct. It is in a form that is grammatically right. So it's adjective, adjective, noun, verb, adverb. That's perfectly valid. So semantics or the meaning of a sentence is not only built from its syntax, it's also built from the coherence of the meaning of the words around it. So the reason this sentence doesn't make sense is not due to syntax, it's due to the fact that this just doesn't make any damn sense, right? Ideas cannot be colorless, colorless things cannot be green, okay? Ideas do not sleep, especially furiously. But word order does give us the most clues on how to process or what's called parse a sentence. So in the next set of lectures, past part of speech tagging, we will cover parsing. I think we'll do named entity recognition first and then parsing, but parsing is a very important component to NLP, so we'll get to it. But if you don't know how to do part of speech tagging, you most certainly cannot do parsing. So we are starting with the most basic thing necessary for many of our other tasks. So a little bit about words themselves. They are the smallest unit of independent language with meaning. Uh, minus morphemes, where morphemes are the smallest unit in the smallest unit of meaning. However, morphemes are not always independent. So remember that morphemes are things like cats and cats, where cat is a singular morpheme and a word. Cats is two morphemes, 
And the second morpheme, the S, indicates more than one cat, but it's not its own independent uh, unit, language unit. So an S is not a word. Okay. And we'll spend this section mostly thinking about how to classify words into their part of speech. So you'll see this labeled as POS tagging, which has always made me laugh because it used to be a very difficult task, but now is one of those well-defined NLP tasks that we can do pretty easily. Okay. So what are some common parts of speech? Well, we've got the big four. So nouns, nouns are things that depict objects, entities. They can also be very abstract, like truth is a noun. Verbs are things that depict actions, states, or occurrences. Adjectives are things that qualify or describe nouns, whereas adverbs are things that qualify or describe verbs. So these are the big four. They carry the most meaning in a sentence, but there are other parts of speech that we're interested in as well. So you can learn more at partofspeech.org. So you never knew there was a whole website about parts of speech, right? And we'll get into the other pieces of speech because they're pretty critical for holding sentences together. And so if we have things like determinants, prepositions, uh, pronouns, those are things that glue the sentence together with syntax to help us understand meaning. All right, let me make this a little bigger text-wise. Now, a quick example on some part of speech tagging, and I really should like figure out how to make this not scroll, <laughs> but anyway. So we're gonna do this part in Python. Most of this section will be in Python. And um, we'll import Spacey and Pandas okay, and load the English language submodule for Spacey. So we have our English language, English language module, and now we're gonna work with a sentence. So at the time that I wrote these notes or wrote this example anyway, there was this really um, kind of outrageous professor event. So you could Google this to look up who this is. I actually don't remember, um, but somebody said something rude on Twitter, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> And so the university that that person worked at had to come out and say, we wouldn't fire this person. But this entire sentence is so incredibly complex. It makes a really great example of while we know what we're doing for part of speech tagging, it is actually a very difficult task. It's just that we happen to have figured it out. Okay. So here's the sentence. We cannot, nor would we, fire professor person that took out their name for his posts on a as a private citizen, as vile and stupid as they are, because of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution forbids us to do so, she wrote in a letter posted on the university website. That is one sentence with about 16 clauses. So it makes for a really good example because it uses several words that we're gonna talk about as being problematic. Computers have a hard time with words that are polysemous or have multiple meanings. So polysemy or polysemy, okay, polysemy is how it looks, um, is where words have many different shades of meanings or completely different meanings. So bank is a very popular example because bank has um, money meanings and river bank kinds of meanings. Unsurprisingly, most words have multiple shades of meanings but here, this one definitely does because in this sense, fire meaning to terminate, to get out of your job versus fire as an on fire, <laughs> it's a flame. And so it makes for a good use case on what kinds of taggers can handle a word in its lesser probabilistic uh, use case. So fire like flame is way more probable than fire like terminate job. So let's see how it handles all this. All right, so this is a quick example of tag, part of speech tagging and spacing. Okay. And so uh, as usual, we're gonna NLP our sentence or our document, and that runs everything that Spacey has for that language module, which in English is a bunch of stuff. We're gonna get back what's called a tuple. Okay. Um, tuple, while it sounds like two, does not mean pair. We'll get to tuples in just a second. We're gonna get back uh, a tuple that's a triple, okay? So we want back the word, the part of speech tag, and then a separate part of speech, like exp like kind of spelled out a little bit. So these are two different tagging systems, tag underscore and part of speech underscore. 
for each word in our sentence. Okay? So say this as um, a triplet set for each word in sentence. And then you can actually put that into a pandas data frame. Dot T here means transpose, just so it printed. And honestly, it probably prints better a little bit, not transpose. Let's see if I zoom out. Yeah, that reads better. Okay. So let's see what happens here. So we're getting back a tuple for each word in our sentence. And we just plopped it into a data frame for easy viewing. Okay, put me back up here since most of the explanatory text is done. Okay. All right, so we cannot, nor would we fire, and you really wanna see what happens to the word fire here. Um, and of course it's cut off. So let's flip over to the notes and actually get it to run this. I thought it still showed it, but pandas data frames do not print that great without some extra work here in R. All right, so I'm gonna run everything so that I can get this going. And I'm gonna not transpose it just temporarily for the moment. So it'll print this way. All right, so we cannot nor would we fire. Right, so here's our keyword that we're interested in. The other words are interesting too, but this one is um, the, the one that will be difficult for us. Okay. So what you see is that we get each word back the one part of speech tag that's more similar to, I think it's the Stanford system, or it might be very similar to Brown. They're so close. You don't know what either of those are just yet, but it's a system of tagging words that is very rich in data. And then more of the traditional universal tag set, which only has 10. Now, what do we, what do we see here? Well, this first one is a pronoun. We use a pronoun. Can is a modal verb, meaning it has to go with something else. Not is kind of this weird adverb part piece, punctuation. Nor is a conjunction. Would is another modal verb. We use another pronoun, fire. In this instance, fire is a verb. Spacey incorrectly tagged fire as a noun. Okay. Otherwise, it's really great. <laughs> but that particular word, and that's one reason why I picked this sentence, is incorrectly tagged. So even the state of the art systems are not perfect. Spacey is very good though. I've given it a very difficult case. But you can see right away that we can start to get all of these different pieces. All right, so very briefly, what is a tuple? Well, we've talked in Python before about lists. Lists are indicated by square brackets, okay? List is like a list in R, a list of things. The things that go in a list can be another list, can be a single item, could be a tuple, could be an entire dictionary. So we've talked a little bit about dictionaries as well. So lists have the square brackets. Dictionaries have the curly brackets. And remember the dictionaries, sorry, are a set of key value pairs. And so dictionaries are like a phone book. You don't repeat people's names and phone numbers. So the keys in a dictionary cannot repeat. The values can be anything. They can be a list. They could be a tuple, they could be another dictionary. So that's really handy for both of those things. List is very flexible. It's one of the most um, useful formats in Python. Dictionaries are really great when you have a one to, to something match. Okay. This last piece is tuples. Now there are a lot of object types in Python, but these are the big three. Okay. Tuples are a special instance of a col small collection, usually a small collection of objects. Okay. Tuples are indicated by the regular round parentheses. Okay. But tuples have a special distinction that they are immutable, which is the fancy word for not changeable. So when you put things into a list, you could change item number four in the list very easily. When you put things into a tuple, you can no longer change tuple part number three. You have to wipe the whole tuple and start over. So if you're thinking, why use tuples over over lists, because it sounds like a list would do me very similar things, but then I can overwrite them. Tuples are more efficient memory-wise. People just really like tuples. So you'll see a lot of them and there are more reasons, but the main one being that that is efficient. Um, it's a it's a efficient way to do things because um, you cannot, in theory, cannot mutate them, change them. You just overwrite them. 
So you'll see a lot of tuples and, and lists being used in, sort of interchangeably here, not interchangeably, but together. So right now we can see that we have a list of tuples that actually transformed into a spacey data, uh, I'm sorry, a pandas data set, not spacey, a pandas data set pretty nicely, but we could also do that with a list of lists. So either way, I just want you to know what the key differences are between them. Lists can be any set of organized things okay, um, in the square brackets. So it can be a list of lists, a list of tuples, a list of dictionaries, a list of mix and match. Have fun. <laughs> uh, tuples are essentially a small set of organized things. I don't think you can do a tuple of tuples though. Hmm. So tuples are kind of small sets of variables. Okay, that are immutable, meaning if you want to fix a tuple, you just rewrite the tuple. And then dictionaries are a set of key value pairs, which are very efficient if they have a one to something match. Okay. Now I say a one to something match because uh, it's not maybe one to one, that implies there's only one thing in each spot. Whereas in, in, in uh, dictionaries, your keys and your values especially can be lists or tuples or dictionaries. So it's a one to something match and depending on what's into something, right? So you might have many objects in that something, but you can only have one key. All right, so that's nouns and then a little bit of Python on the side. The other thing that we can talk about is phrases. So phrases here are where are, are potentially what the problem is. And so if you take out that comma, space is actually more likely to get it right. So there's something special about that comma that indicates phrasal structure that's making Spacey get that wrong. Okay. Now, phrases themselves aren't necessarily um, demarcated by commas. It's a fairly common thing to do in English. However, not all languages use this system, but a phrase is one or more words that break into some sort of category. Those categories are driven by their parts of speech. So noun phrases have the noun as the head word. Head word meaning the main the main word, not necessarily meaning the first word, but meaning the main semantic category, okay. usually depicting the actor in the sentence, the thing doing the action, or the actee, the thing being acted upon in the sentence. So actors, remember, are the things doing the action, actees are the things receiving the action. The verb phrase, where the verb acts as our head word, this is usually depend depicting the action in a sentence. So sometimes people, um, what do you call it, predicates. Oh, I've lost it. My English teacher would be so mad. Uh, the predicates and that other thing when you break down trees. But it's more informative to talk about noun phrases and verb phrases because verb phrases sometimes include noun phrases. So it helps if you break them up. Okay, subject and predicate, maybe? Yeah. Either way. If it is a cluster of, ver uh, of, of words with a noun, it's more than likely going to have a noun phrase in it. Okay. However, with beyond these two, we can also talk about prepositional phrases. This is generally modifier phrases. They're sort of, they're, the whole phrase is kind of an adjective or it's a direct object. So up the stairs here is a prepositional phrase within a verb phrase. And that's really handy because it's modifying that verb. So we would actually break that down further. Okay, then the stairs themselves is a noun phrase. And then adjective or adverb phrases where we are modifying something else in the sentence. So the cat is quick, quick here is an adverb phrase. Okay, now, if you look at this slide, one thing you'll notice is you have to know the part of speech to know what type of phrase it is. So we cannot do any of this named entity recognition or dependency parsing without knowing what part of speech it is. So clearly pretty critical to understand part of speech tagging. All right, so we'll cover more of that kind of stuff in the next couple of weeks. But first we have to figure out how to tag parts of speech to be able to do phrase and parsing, phrase tagging and parsing. So understanding words and phrases also helps us understand grammar. And that's how we can build and construct sentences. So if you're going to build a chat bot, you got to understand phrases. You really got to understand parts of speech. So a little bit here on grammars. 
Um, a dependency grammar usually focuses on the words in the sentence and their dependencies on each other. So, you know, the verb is tied to the noun, right? Because um, the verb determines what goes in a sentence. So I'd argue that verb is the most important word in a sentence because it determines what's going to happen. It determines what kinds of things go before it and what kinds of things go after it. So some words require a direct, what's called a direct object or another noun. Okay? So if you just say, I kicked, most people go, you kicked what? Because they're expecting some sort of direct object or noun, the ball, right? Um, you could just say, I kicked. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just people are left hanging, waiting, right? And so there are um, dependencies of the relationship between these objects. Okay. And so dependency parsing in general is verb focused. It uses the part of speech and the word order to determine these dependencies. And it's really good for question and answer type systems. Contrast that with what's called constituency grammar, which is the stuff you learn in grade school where you are making phrase structures or building sentences into hierarchical trees. Constituency grammar is really handy to understand sentence complexity because the more complex the tree, the, the further the deep the branches, the more hard it, the harder it is to process, right? Whereas dependency parsing is better at understanding what's happening in the sentence. Okay. Now, constituency grammar is actually, I would not say more often used, hmm. That's tricky because you don't always see what people are doing under the hood in their NLP systems, but many dependency parsers are built on top of constituency grammar parsers, meaning it just takes the constituency grammar and converts it to a dependency grammar. So I would say they're still very popular to be used if only to leverage them for dependency systems. Um, also, they're very well structured and it's a, easy, a better defined task than dependency parsing, meaning it's a little bit easier to map computer programs onto them because there are potentially less um, combinations of the way to do it. Okay. Now we break sentences down usually into noun phrases and verb phrases. Noun phrases often in, involve determinants or determiners like B and A, adjectives and nouns. And so it kind of makes the rules for these phrases. Notice again, though, everything I've said depends on knowing what the part of speech is. So quick note on part of speech taggers. There are many parts of speech. So a noun could be labeled as a noun, a plural noun, a proper noun, pronoun, which is a different type. Verbs can be labeled with their tense options, present tense, future tense, past tense, gerund. Okay. This is in English, clearly. Conjunctions can be coordinated conjunctions. Subordinate connections are just plain old conjunctions. And uh, so on. So what does that mean for part of speech tagging? Well, we do have to define the level of specificity we want to work with if it's an option within that tagger. Most taggers use minimally what's called the universal part of speech system. That's 10 tags. Maximally, they use some of the larger systems like the Brown Corpus or the Stanford um, system. And I think it's called the Stanford system. Now I'm questioning that, but there are several of them that are very similar <laughs> that have like 55 tags. And so I always tell people to start with the most complex system because you can always tag down. So if I have the Brown system, for example, I could always convert it easily into the universal part of speech corpus. But if I want to make it more specific, I have to re-tag everything and that can be quite slow. So always start with the most complex and then convert down if you'd like. Okay. And this depends on the corpus that is used to train the system. Um, obviously we'd like our systems to, to allow for complexity, um, but they don't have to. So you saw on Spacey, it has the complex system and the simple system. And it also depends on the training for that tagger. Okay, so we'll work with both. Now the set of possible tags are called tag sets and you can convert between them. So one more slide here. Oh no, I'm sorry. This is where I wanted to stop. So we're gonna pause here to keep these videos from being way too long. And um, in the next little section, we're gonna talk about deciding how to tag words and actually get started tagging words in R.